Hello, everyone, and welcome to CSAS. Uh, we're delighted to have you here for what I think is going to be a really uh, interesting and fascinating event. My name is Max Bergman. I'm the director of the Stuart Center on Northern European Studies and the director of the Europe-Russia-Eurasia program here at CSIS. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce our, our panelists for what I'm sure will be a really fascinating discussion on the current state and future of the Russian economy almost one year after Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, though, let me also announce that this event uh, will also be soon made available on our podcast, Russian Roulette. Russian Roulette was dormant for a while. We are very excited to be relaunching it, uh, and you'll be able to uh, access this, uh, this event through that podcast uh, shortly. So if you're not subscribing to Russian Roulette already, please find it wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, now, let me turn to our panelists today. Uh, they're leading analysts in the study of international economics, political science, and the global energy market. Um, first, we're very delighted to have Dr. Sergei Alexashenko, Alex sorry for, for bungling your name. Uh, Sergei is currently a, a board member at, the, at both the Boris Nemtsov Foundation for Freedom and the Free Russia Foundation. After receiving his PhD, Sergei spent the 1990s working in public service as a senior expert on the Commission on Economic Reform in the Government of the USSR. Uh, then was Deputy Finance Minister uh, of Russia in charge of budgetary planning and tax policy, and afterwards, first Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Russia. Later, he worked in private business, including as President and CEO of Merrill Lynch in Russia from 2006 to 2008. From 2008 to 2014, Sergei was the Director of Macroeconomic Research at Moscow's Higher School of Economics, and in 2014, he relocated to Washington, D.C., where he's a non-resident, or where he was a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings until 2019. Uh, and from 2015 to 2020, Sergei advised the National Bank of Ukraine, along with the country's Ministry of Finance and National Government. Normally, I don't go through a bio so extensively, <laughs> but I think it's in important context for our audience, and now he's uh, uh, pleasantly retired and we're delighted that you were able to join us uh, this morning. Uh, next, uh, we have Ben Cahill. I'm not going to go through Ben's bio uh, as thoroughly because he's down the hall from me at CSIS. Ben is a senior fellow here in the Energy, Security, and Climate Change Program at CSIS. He covers oil markets, geopolitics, and macro trends affecting the oil and gas industry. Ben was previously a director uh, in Energy Intelligence's research and advisory group and led its country risk, pack, uh, risk practice, advising oil and gas companies on politics, economics, and policy risks. And last, but certainly not least, is my, my new colleague, Maria Snegavaya, uh, who recently joined us here at CSIS as a senior fellow uh, for Russia in our uh, Russia uh, Eurasia program. Uh, Maria has, uh, has an extensive background focusing on Russia. She uh, has a PhD from Columbia University, was previously associated with uh, the Center for New American Security, the Atlanta Council, and the Center for European Analysis, and has taught at a number of universities. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us today. Now, Sergey, I want to turn to you first because uh, there's lots of conversation and discussion of how the unprecedented Western sanctions against Russia have impacted the Russian economy. And I want sort of your kind of quick, quick overview or take on where does the Russian economy stand right now, uh, almost one year uh, after the decision to invade? Uh, thank you for this question. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as usual, economists say on the one hand or other. So <laughs> there is no definite answer to, the, to your question, though it is very important. Uh, on the one hand, the Russian economy is definitely in a very complicated situation. Last year, the most recent figure of Russian Rostat was growth of 5.6% in 21. So the forecast for the 22 by the Russian government was 4 to 4.5. The result of this year is somewhere in between minus 2.5, minus 3%. So the gap is 8% of GDP, so it's significant. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to remember that uh, when you produce uh, not butter but guns, the GDP may grow. 
And definitely that was the, the effect in the second half of the 22, mm -hmm. when Rostat reported that due to the information we received from the Federal Treasury, the expenditures increased, and that's why GDP is declining much less. So definitely military expenditures of Russia increased in the second half of the year, and this boosted industry, industrial production that boosted GDP. So all in all, the economy reversed its trend. Instead of growth, we have a decline. But saying all that, it's definitely not a collapse. It's not a disaster. It's not, uh, we may not say that Russian economy is in tatters, that it is destroying, that Putin lacks fund to continue his war. No, it's not true. It's not true. Uh, the budget uh, for the last year was more or less balanced. In the very end of the year, Ministry of Finance increased expenditures, saying we finance expenditures over the next year. So the budget deficit is uh, less than 2.5% of GDP. Uh, Russia has more than 6% uh, of GDP as its fiscal reserves available to the Ministry of Finance at any point in time. The exchange rate is stable, inflation is low. So. Good and bad. Mm -hmm. What do you prefer? The half is the glass is half full or half empty. So essentially, if I, as a non-economist, uh, essentially there's been a lot of stimulus that the Kremlin has put into the economy, especially in the defense sector. Is that and that has helped counteract some of the declines that we might have expected to see. Is that is that a, along with the increase in in gas and oil revenue caused by oil prices and gas prices increasing? Is that a, a accurate kind of summation? Uh, yes, this is accurate. I would add maybe one more point about the effect of sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, it is easy to impose sanctions and to get the economic effect when the economy is somewhere in the middle of the industrial chain. Mm -hmm. When, like China, you receive of a lot of imports, you uh, add your value added, and you sell your products to other countries. Russia, Russian economy is in the very beginning of this industrial chain. Russia is supplying natural resources, commodities. And uh, you cannot substitute Russia with some other countries. Yes, Europe may not purchase Russian oil. It will purchase uh, oil from the Gulf, from Angola, I don't know, from Venezuela. But Russian oil will go to China, India, and so on. So global economy cannot put Russia out. Yeah, it's, it's not a question of time. It's not a question of capacity. It's a question of natural resources. And that's why, yes, there were factors that benefited Russian economy, like oil price, gas price, and of course military expenditures. Okay, yes, st statistics doesn't care about uh, guns yeah. or butter. Yeah. Let me ask you about the Russian central bank sanctions. This is, I think, one of the most surprising sanctions that were levied by, by the West, according to, I think, the Financial Times reporting at the time. Uh, then Prime Minister Mario Draghi got on the phone with his former central bank colleague, Janet uh, Yellen, uh, at the Treasury Department, and they kind of worked on the uh, worked up uh, and pushed for the US and, and Europe to put in place sanctions against the Russian central bank as a former Russian central banker um, how do you assess the impact of these sanctions uh, generally the the view in the West is that uh, the the competence of the Russian central bank has really been been highlighted by this crisis and they've effectively steered Russia through some of these sanctions but how, how do you assess the impact on the central bank of Russia, uh, and, and how do you think it has responded? Um, initially, let's say before, before, sanction, before Russian invasion, and before sanctions on the central bank of Russia were imposed, I shared the view that this is a nuclear option and that it should have a very significant effect on the Russian economy, on Russian financial markets. Nevertheless, we see that it, doesn't, it didn't happen. And uh, today we can uh, give you a very simple answer why. On the one hand, uh, the floating exchange rate is like the market. You have supply and demand. And if you cut demand by half, you have changed in price. So the Russian ruble devalued virtually by 80% in the first two weeks after the invasion. And after that, the central bank said, okay, Russian ruble is not con uh, fully convertible anymore. We cut any demand for repatriation of profits. We cut any demand for paying dividends. We uh, for, prohibit uh, foreigners to sell their securities in the Russian market and to get profits, to get liquidity in any way. So we cut the demand. N the market reacted in a very natural way. If you cut the demand, the price goes down. Is it a clever solution? Yes. If your job as a central banker to keep the calm, to keep uh, the stability in the financial markets, it is a very good decision. But it's like kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. So then the can 
growing by every tick. So it's becoming bigger, bigger, and bigger. And maybe next uh, chairman of the central bank, or after the next, he will solve this enormous problem. It will not be a can, it will be a barrel. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it will be a very uh, complicated story. Another, another part of the story is that normally uh, the central bank needs uh, foreign exchange reserves uh, if you participate in the currency trading. If you sell and buy foreign exchange trying to manage to control the uh, exchange rate of your national currency, moreover in the time of turbulence. Since spring 2014, the Russian central bank said, okay, we do not participate in the market, it's free floating, and since then, the Russian central bank did not use its reserves. Yeah. So, Russian economy has a very strong current account, that means Russian export is much bigger than Russian import. And on the Russian market, usually, there's a big oversupply of the foreign exchange. In this situation, central bank doesn't need its reserves. So on the one hand, yes, central bank was clever to cut demand. On the other hand, we may anticipate that Russian economy doesn't need reserves of the central bank to use them on a daily basis. Fascinating. Um, ben, I want to turn to you to talk about um, this effort uh, by the US and Europe to try to deprive Russia of, of oil revenue, the oil price cap. Essentially, part of the effect of the war, uh, oil and gas prices increased dramatically. Uh, then, so, but on the other hand, Western economies want to keep oil on the market. They don't want oil prices to go up. It has direct impact here on, a, on especially on American politicians running for election. So, if maybe you could break down what the U.S. and Europe are, are trying to achieve with the oil price cap, and, and how you assess uh, how it's how uh, 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 how its impact thus far. Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, it's great to be with this group. So the price cap is a clever scheme, but it's pretty complicated. So if you'll bear with me, maybe I'll take a, a step back to answer that question. So in June of last year, the European Union essentially passed a ban on seaborne crude oil imports from Russia, starting on December fifth and a ban on refined product imports by tanker starting um, on February 5th. And that was a big deal. Um, another really significant part of the EU package was that the EU wanted to ban all support services for Russian seaborne oil trade. So shipping, insurance, uh, financial support, brokering, everything that goes into getting a barrel of oil traded uh, by sea. And when the EU passed those measures, I think it created a pretty significant risk that would see a sharp shock to Russian supply and exports. And so some policymakers really worried that this could create a lot of problems in the oil market. Um, Especially it, here in the United States. Exactly. I think Washington got very U.S. officials, yeah. Treasury officials were really worried that you'd have a sharp decline in exports and a price spike. And that's why the price cap was really created. It was designed to find a clever way to depress Russian revenue, but still keep the market well supplied. Mm. And essentially the scheme says, as long as you trade oil above $60 a barrel, you can get all the support services you want from the EU, brokering, financial support, everything else. But you have to have people on the value chain verify that this transaction is for oil traded above $60 a barrel. If that happens, great, access everything you want. If it doesn't, you're not gonna be able to access those G7 services or those services housed in the G7 in the EU. Um, and that will make it harder for you. Scare services um, makes it harder for Russia to do business. So that's kind of the operating principle behind the price cap. So the embargo and the price cap went into effect in December for crude oil exports. And we're still in kind of the early days of this, so it's, it's quite early to draw conclusions. But I think what's happened so far is that, you know, there are really two parts of this. There's the volume impact and the price impact. Um, in terms of the price impact, what the embargo has done, I think more so than the price cap, it's really the embargo, the lost exports to Europe. What that has meant is that Russia has had to ship oil over much longer distances. So oil that is loaded in the Black Sea and the Baltic can't be sold in Europe anymore, it has to be sold in Asia. So you have to ship it over longer distances, you have to pay more for freight and insurance. And what that has done is extend and even deepen the differential or the discount between Russian oil and the world oil price. So the price impact seems to be pretty considerable. It's on the order of $30 a barrel plus. Um, the volume impact, we don't know yet. Uh, in December, seaborne exports from Russia did decline pretty significantly. It might have been 12 to 14%. You know, the estimates vary a little bit. But clearly there was a decline. The question is, was that a one-off? 
as the market adjusts to the price cap, tries to figure out all the mechanisms, bankers, traders, shippers, everyone else develop a comfort level with it. Um, and if that's the case, will exports rebound? I happen to think they probably will. Um, but as I said, it's early days and there are a lot of moving parts here. A big question, I think, actually probably the central question is how well can Russia adjust and sell its oil outside the reach and control of the G7 so that it can kind of defuse the significance of this G7 in the EU price cap? Mm -hmm. And I think that remains to be seen. I guess one question there is that isn't it in the countries that are buying this oil to just buy it as cheap as possible? Yes. So that uh, while I think we feared compliance of countries like India that have a long-standing relationship with Russia yep. uh, and have you know, dramatically increased their imports of, of Russian energy, you know, isn't this a good excuse for them to say, hey, we still want your oil, but you know, there's this price yeah. cap thing that's super annoying, but sorry, we're, it's $40 and not 60 Yeah, I think a central idea behind the price cap and the embargo was even if countries like China and India don't join on formally, they're still going to have a lot of leverage because Russia doesn't have great options. Yeah. I mean, all the oil that it has to displace from former sales to Europe has to go to Asia. And that really means India, China, a little bit to Turkey, whatever else can send to the Middle East and other places. So those buyers have a lot of leverage. They know that Russia needs them. And what they're demanding is better terms. So I think that's what significantly deepened that discount. And I expect that to continue. And thus far, are we seeing, the, you know, because one of the big issues here would be compliance of not countries necessarily, but, but companies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, we, we've talked offline a number of times about how you know, oil f tends to find a way, companies and, and tend to figure out how to get oil to market. Do you think that that is something that will adapt to sort of figure out workarounds to this price cap such that uh, Russia can, will be able to sort of figure out how to sell it yeah. at, at whatever it wants and we'll yeah. have companies that will facilitate that? Yeah. I mean, we're about six weeks into this process, and so far I think that the compliance with the price cap mechanism is a little bit unclear. I've seen a lot of conflicting reports about this. Um, there were media reports that there were cargoes that loaded for export to India, for example, that abided by the, the so-called attestation process of the price cap, where you know, buyers, everyone involved in the transaction has to verify that it was above $60 a barrel. Uh, but then other reports suggested that those aren't, actually were not Russian crude cargoes, it was Kazakh crude, or it was Russian fuel oil, things that were exempt from the price cap. So I haven't really seen strong evidence so far that price cap compliance is widespread and that a lot of people in India and China are playing ball. I think that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. So, so far I think that the, the price impact is a little bit more clear and visible in the marketplace than the actual compliance with the price cap. What, are there certain triggers or a timeline that you're looking at to really judge whether this is a success? And, and maybe what would be successful in, in, your, in your eyes of, of this oil price cap? I, I mean, we can't yeah. assume that there's gonna be total compliance, there's gonna be always some workarounds, but I mean, the, since the, the central objective here is to deprive Russia of, of revenue, I mean, yeah. what, are, what are you looking at, um, yeah. uh, looking, looking out into 2023 for some notable events or triggers? I think what G7 and EU policymakers are looking for is clear evidence that people in the value chain are abiding by the price cap and using the attestation process filing all the paperwork they need to and being transparent about it. Um, if there's evidence that more people are taking that up, they'll be quite happy with that in the coming months. On the other hand, the evidence that it's not being applied that effectively would be if Russia is successful in using the so-called shadow fleet of tankers. In other words, tankers that it owns outright or that it can insure itself or find alternative insurance. If that fleet is big enough for Russia to really operate outside the reach of the G7, then I think it's gonna show that the application of the price cap probably won't be as widespread and won't have the kind of leverage that policymakers wanted. Interesting. And I think we should know within a couple months. And the other thing to keep an eye on, and this is adding another layer of complication, is that we have the price cap for refined products coming very soon. And we're still awaiting guidance from the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control and its counterparts in Europe on how this is gonna work. There will be multiple price caps for light products like diesel and for heavy products like fuel oil. But in terms of the mechanism, how this is going to be applied, it's going to be much more complicated, and we still don't really know all the details yet. And just one, one quick question on, on that, on the refined products. My understanding is uh, that could put Russia at a real disadvantage because you can get refined products more easily 
elsewhere in the in the global market and and sort of where the world is sort of less dependent on the supply of those refined products and so this could could impact Russia perhaps more directly do you mm. think is that the case or yes and no I think um, it's been pretty successful in selling crude to buyers like India and China because they can refine it make their own products and sell them mm -hmm. and earn huge margins I mean Indian refiners are having a field day with this current system they're very happy with it mm -hmm. Uh, Russian refined products compete directly with them. Um, so they don't have the same interest in taking those. I think where it's more complicated is that the, the market for refined products for the last year has been tighter, uh, particularly for diesel. And you probably noticed in the United States, diesel prices have been quite expensive. It's actually a big trigger for inflation because it's expensive to transport goods. So there's not as much wiggle room in the market. And you also don't have the same number of product tankers, tankers that can take the stuff and ship it around the world. So I think policymakers are treading a little bit more cautiously when it comes to the product picture. I want to. I'm going to turn to Maria, but I just want to ask Sergey, as a former Russian central banker, how, how what is your view on the oil price cap, and, and would you be panicked right now if you were in Moscow having to sort of face down what what is now looks like it's having some impact at least on on Russia's uh, oil revenues? Uh, I would be more concerned than Ben. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I, I, may, I do not see any impact on the quantity of export of Russian oil as, a, as of today, even in December. It seems to me it was just seasonal fluctuation, and we will get the data shortly, and this maybe this week. Uh, but what we definitely see is the decline in price. Uh, in, starting from April to November, the discount of, of Russian oil to Brent was 25 percent, plus minus several percentage points. Better to tell not about dollars, but in percent. In December, the discount reached 37 percent. So December embargo, European embargo plus uh, price cap, affected Russian economy. And at the same time, in December, Russian ruble devalued something like more than 10 percent in one month. And the data Central Bank reported yesterday on the <clears throat> initial estimate of the balance of payments demonstrated that the current account shrinked, uh, in, shrunk in uh, December significantly, very close to zero. So being the central banker, I would be more concerned about what's going on. January is not the best uh, month to compare because long holidays in the beginning of the month. Nevertheless, the, the situation has changed and it's not as simple as we may predict. Thank you. Maria, maybe I'll turn to you to um, talk about how people in Russia, do you think, are, are being impacted right now by the, the sanctions in, in the current economic state? What is the impact on kind of the average Russian man, woman in, in, in the street, in, in, uh, not just in Moscow, but, but throughout the country? Yeah, uh, Max, when I'm asked questions like this, since I'm not in Russia, I always ask my followers mm -hmm. on Facebook and especially Telegram. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you, every single time the um, a number of responses I get is overwhelming. So I already have over 100 uh, of answers mm -hmm. there. People obviously are concerned, and I just posted this question like an hour ago. Uh, certainly, there is an impact. I don't think, though, that's an impact of the newly introduced oil embargo and the price cap just yet. I think it has been uh, people who had a chance to feel it quite yet, uh, while I actually believe this will be a much bigger blow than anything that has been introduced before. Uh, but from the sanctions that have already been in place, you certainly uh, see the impact. Of course, it's not as pronounced as, uh, not such a big blow as Ukrainian citizens, for example, experience, but it is there. And I would describe it as a, some sort of strangulation, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the quality of the products, first of all, everybody mentions that it has deteriorated uh, substantively. Uh, Branko Milanovic famously described it as regressive import substitution, and that's what people uh, describe, right? As some sort of things where, um, you know, starting with the software, computer software, household appliances, all the way to regular products, even milk products, right? Something really basic, basic female hygiene. Those are um, uh, replaced slowly, gradually for, by inferior quality products. Some of the Russian brands who nobody has heard before, usually with certain editions written by hand that please don't use it like in certain circumstances <laughs> because it may not, not behave you know, as you, the way as you expected it, just because it's so bad. Uh, so this is something that people are complaining a lot. In particular, one particular sector where a lot of people seem to be affected is medication. Like they, uh, a lot of good um, um, 
uh, treatments have disappeared or prices have skyrocketed and many report not have uh, haven't been given a decent treatment at the hospitals because those lack access to necessary like medication one woman read that she was treated with a cold treatment when she got pneumonia at the hospital some sort of examples and more cases like that uh, last but not the least tourism of course like uh, those groups most affected and uh, most easily targeted by the West, mm -hmm. of course, are the groups, the so-called low middle class, um, middle class more broadly, people who traveled abroad, who used to travel abroad, uh, they don't have cards, they cannot pay uh, electronically for Western services, right? It's very hard now to travel outside of Russia just because there's just so few, um, uh, you know, air, air companies that offer those services at this point. So if you're you know, going to the grocery store, you would see, you know, some of maybe some of the Western products, cleaning products, or other things like that that you would used to buy are no longer. Are, no are, liquor, for example, yeah. Yeah. Also, <laughs> the <laughs> loss of access to, to Scottish whiskey, I think, is yeah, uh, American gone. bourbon would uh, somewhat devastating. But the, uh, but so everything is store. You're you're still able to kind of live the life that you lived before. But the quality of the the goods, the, yeah. you don't have that iPhone anymore. It's, a, it's just a more pessimistic life than before, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. And and there's also been reports of, for instance, like the Russian car sector being hit and, and sort of having to return to kind of 1980s uh, safety standards with no airbags and and electronics being worse. Is that are you see is that something you're seeing throughout various economic sectors that is, this is becoming hard for Russian industrial production as well? Yeah, looking at the statistics, right, and that we should keep in mind, right, uh, that uh, the Kremlin is actually trying to hide uh, the information, uh, not to, to essentially to avoid showcasing that things are pretty bad. So the fact that we are still able to see that things are pretty bad tells us that in reality, most likely, things are even worse. I think I wonder if Sergey uh, will agree with that. Uh, so from that perspective, yes, the car industry, the aviation industry, are the other ones, for example, uh, they are hardly hit. Pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned uh, before, metal industry is also badly hit um, because of the recently introduced um, sanctions by uh, European Union, among others. So everything is there for sure, and but I would call it, as I said, strangulation, because that's yep. not a, one major big blow that happens at one particular moment. It's a slow process. And of course, uh, Russian uh, businessmen are quite creative, so they're also finding ways to substitute for um, some of the products, right? So it's a cat mouse game in this sense. And maybe to ask you a bit about how, how the Russian economy reacted after the 2014 sanctions. I mean, there is, uh, you know, there are sanctions against agricultural products and, and, and or Russia did sanctions against Western agricultural products that were coming back into Russia, but it, we saw the creation <laughs> that was sort of beneficial to some of, of Russia's uh, agricultural industries. Agriculture, some yeah. um, <laughs> boutique cheese sellers started to emerge. So, I mean, this does also create some opportunities within Russia to fill certain market gaps that now emerge because they don't really have to compete with Western products. Is, is that accurate? Well, um, yes, to some extent, though, right? Mm -hmm. If history is any, um, you know, it teaches us something, looking at the comparative examples of where such sanctions have been in place, South Africa, Iran, not similar, comparable. Uh, sanctions, of course, those are much smaller scale economies. You see that uh, almost inevitably in more, all, all of those instances, uh, domestic um, import substitution is unable to substitute for what, what is missing. Partly because these are not like perfectly developed economies. They actually used to struggle with many factors like corruption, uh, right? Uh, lack of efficiency. Uh, it's the people who are closer to the Kremlin who get the contracts and the most attractive parts of the, of business rather than those uh, that are the most success who are the most successful and those factors they don't disappear always uh, just overnight just because the west introduced the sanctions as a result as we see usually as a result of these major sanctions uh, import substitution is there but it's unable to provide um, an, uh, analog analogous products of the same scale so one way or another uh, even those sectors where russia has potential like as agriculture for example or, or uh, farming more broadly, right? Uh, in those areas, Russia will probably still be lagging behind. So it will find some resources to substitute. Russians will not starve. 
uh, but the quality of those products will be far uh, below what it could have been otherwise. Yeah. So, and it will be have a negative effect on the Russian economy. So this is something that you know, the average Russian is noticing in their daily daily lives that there has been you know, the sanctions are, are therefore essentially impacting the average Russian. Uh, this then leads to the kind of, uh, as we would describe it, $64,000 question of how this is then impacting Russian public opinion, Russian sentiment towards the Kremlin, towards Vladimir Putin, towards the war in Ukraine. Are we seeing any sort of deterioration of, of, of support or, or growing angst within, within Russia? Well, that's a notorious question, right? How do you measure uh, um, public opinion in Russia, autocratic regimes? Uh, looking at dynamic of the polls, though, uh, when it comes to uh, blunt questions, right, when you ask them directly, do you support Putin, right, do you support this special military operation, uh, there's not as, many, not as much change, um, and if there was any change, it wasn't due to the sanction, it was actually self-induced by the Kremlin after uh, mobilization was introduced. But there are more subtle questions that you can ask, uh, like do you generally support peace talks, for example, as opposed to continuing this war? And there, for sure, you, we do see a change when now majority of Russians, over 53-55%, depending on the poll, actually support peace talks as opposed to continuation of this war. Uh, this is different from uh, what things used to be in the spring, and that can plausibly be, uh, I think, attributed to a combination of circumstances, including mobilization, you know, Russia not performing as well and as victoriously on the ground in Ukraine, as well as sanctions and deterioration of the economic situation. Generally, uh, we have, uh, since 2014, seen the pardon that generally uh, Russians who feel that the economic situation is doing worse are less supportive of all, all sorts of international uh, escalations by the Kremlin, as opposed to those Russians who feel they're fine or whose well-being is improving. So level, subjective well, level of well-being, especially is dynamic, is very closely typically associated to uh, support of international aggression. Um, so uh, from that, uh, generally, you could potentially expect, as, as Russians become more exposed to the consequences of this war, especially with the consequences of the oil embargo and oil price cap in place, I think you're likely to see further uh, support for peace negotiations, peace talks. Although, again, I would not be too, you know, um, hopeful about this since there's also other factors, right? First of all, does it even matter for the Kremlin at all what Russians think? I believe it does, but it's not like the first, on the, the, the top first three maybe considerations that the Kremlin has, maybe top five, top, top ten. And second, um, of how long is this process going to take? Uh, because it's taken definitely much longer than one would have hoped when the sanctions from hell were introduced. Let me ask uh, quickly about mobilization and both how that's sort of impacting the Russian economy, because a huge impact in, in suddenly having 300,000 people uh, roughly pulled into, uh, out of their kind of daily lives into the Russian military. Uh, I think roughly equal that number have, have uh, perhaps fled and left Russia. So this must have um, a real impact on Russian public opinion. Maybe, Sergei, I'll ask you for your mm -hmm. assessment of the impact of, of that economically. But, but Maria, maybe you could comment on how, that, how you see that at right now impacting. Certainly. It's been uh, so far since the beginning of this war the largest single uh, event that affected uh, public opinion. Uh, people were scared. It, it actually really affected every single Russian personally. And uh, the Russian's public opinion works in a way that it's the personal events that are particularly hurtful for them. Uh, it's not something abstract that happens somewhere else. So yes, once the mobilization was in place, we saw the decline, a uh, radical decline in all sort of indices. Putin support, approval for special military operation, as well as general uh, uh, indicators of social well-being, uh, where the country is going, all of them declined by at least 10% or more. Uh, but after this radical uh, decline, 
Uh, and after the first wave mobilization sort of ended or at least slowed down, so to speak, because honestly, frankly, it's never ended. It's still ongoing in some one way or another. Um, we saw uh, the public opinion pull sort of recovering from this blow. And by now, effectively, they're back to where, where they were before, which is a very interesting phenomenon because the war is still there and Russians know it. So it's almost a deliberate attempt on the Russian uh, public opinion side to sort of... Um, Forget it, you know, you know, life continues as normal, things are fine, uh, let's, let's, and essentially, let's go back to where we fine. were. Um, not necessarily rallying, uh, I'd say going with the flow, because mm -hmm. it's not the rallying sentiment, it's not like euphoria and happiness and everybody's so supportive of what Putin is doing. It's more, a lot of the polls report anxiety, uncertainty, fear. Uh, it's not at all feelings of joy and happiness, like lower, much lower, uh, significantly lower numbers of those um, uh, of Russians right now are happy. As opposed to, for example, Crimean annexation, which was, this is when people were really genuinely happy and uh, euphoric. So that's a different sort of sentiment, and that's actually potentially good news for um, sanction designers, uh, because it shows that this support, it's crafted, right, but it's not probably very stable, since people, the motivation behind it is very different, right? It's not happiness at all. It's anxiety, fear, and uncertainty. So again, maybe I could turn back to you, just a comment on the mobilization, how you see that uh, impacting the Russian economy. Okay, Max, if I may, I would uh, argue a little bit with Maria Please. Uh, <laughs> on, on public opinion. Uh, we should not underestimate uh, the effects and successes of Kremlin's propaganda. Uh, the guideline and idea of Kremlin is to make Russian people don't think about the war. It is a special military operation, something small. Please, don't look at it. Don't pay attention. And Russian people, they do not get information about what's going on in Ukraine, except of short messages from Russian Minister of Defense, a small victory here, a small victory there. Russian people do not see atrocities on Russian TV. So, and that's why, uh, from what I read from polls, is that people uh, generally, there is a big straight loss, 25 to 30 percent, who says uh, foreign policy is too complicated, let Putin think about it. And we trust Putin, we don't care what he is doing. It's his job. And another, another 25 to 30 percent of people, they try, try to self-isolate themselves from outside news. So they don't look at any news at all. So we, we are not interested about Ukraine. We don't want to hear. It's bad. Maybe it's bad news, but we don't want to know. And that's why it's more complicated. It's, I would say, yes, uh, people uh, support peace talks, but it happens when Putin started to care. We are ready to talk. We are ready to negotiate with, with Ukraine, but it's Ukraine. They don't want to negotiate. And then people react. Okay, if Putin says negotiations, yes, we support negotiations. If Putin will say, okay, let's launch an offense on Kyiv, people will say, okay, let, let's go for the victory. On uh, economic effect of mobilization, once again, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, generally speaking, I would say it's neutral. Uh, if uh, 300 men goes to the military service, and another 300 leave Russia, so it's approximately 1% of the labor force. All other equals, one, minus 1% 1 of labor force, it's mi minus 1% of GDP, and less, con okay, and that should shrink the economy by one percentage point. But on the other hand, it's military expenditures, and uh, Russian budget pays to those in the army uh, four times higher salary than average in the country. So if, you, if your salary, if your month, monthly income was 50,000 rubles, it's something like, I don't know, $800 uh, at the moment, and in the army you get four times more, okay, you do not spend those money in Ukraine, but you send those money to your family, and your fa family spends more. So that's, uh, okay, you have less uh, manpower in the economy, but you have more expenditures, consumer expenditures, and that's why, as I said in the beginning, military expenditures, they does matter. Guns, not butter, but statistics doesn't care. Well, I think this was sort of gives us an excellent sort of baseline uh, of where we are today, of where Russia's economy is today, that they clearly have taken a hit. Russian consumers are feeling it. The energy sector uh, is is seeing some loss of revenue. Uh, I want to maybe turn to looking forward a bit. Going, you know, if we look 
uh, put our prognosticator hat on and look at 2023, 2024, where do, you, where do we see Russia going, where its economy is going? And then also maybe think about what steps the West can take to, uh, to tighten the screws or to take uh, additional action. Um, Sergey, how do you see the Russian uh, economy now adapting and evolving uh, going forward into, into 2023? I guess one question I have is whether um, this is going to put strain on a number of Russian companies, Russian banks that perhaps aren't the most uh, above board, that are maybe not the most well run, uh, and that when you see sort of a, a shock to the system, as we saw in, in, in America in 2008 and the world did as well, that created a cascading effect on a number of uh, businesses. How do you see 2023 playing out? Do you think there could be some sort of cascade effect in the Russian economy where we uh, see conti- you know, continued fail- or additional failures in, in some of the private sector of some certain companies? Uh, Max, I think that uh, 2023 will be a difficult year for the Russian economy, and I do not share the optimism of uh, President Putin or of the Russian government that in 2023 the Russian economy will pass the bottom point and will start to recover. I think that uh, this year Russian economy will be in the phase like a chairwoman of the central bank called it structural transformation. Structural transformation means Russian economy will cut all maximum ties with the economy of uh, industrial nations, so with the developed world. And uh, some of issues may be uh, resolved. Uh, for example, yes, Russian uh, air, aviation company, Russian air companies, they are not able to purchase or to lease new airplanes from Boeing or from Airbus, but they have stolen 500 Airbus from leasing companies, and they may cannibalize some of them to substitute parts for the others. So it is solution of the problem. Yes, it is a can down the road, because again, okay, many years from now you have to pay for all this, but okay, it allows you to solve the problem. In some sectors, uh, it will be next to impossible to solve. Uh, in um, 2019, uh, before the COVID, Russia produced uh, something like 1.7 million uh, cars per year. Last year, it was uh, less than 600. So the gap is uh, less, made, than less than 600,000, yeah. Uh, the gap is the result of what we call voluntary sanctions or moral sanctions, mm-hmm. when major brands, they left Russia. And yes, plants are there, equipment is there, but you have no components, you have no parts from Germany, from France, from Japan, from Korea, and you cannot assemble those cars. And so that is, okay, that is forever. That is forever. Russian uh, biggest car producer uh, inherited from the Soviet Union, built by Italians, Fiat. They report, okay, we have produced, I don't know, 190,000 cars. Yes, but 20% of them are incomplete, like in the Soviet Union. Some of them uh, have no uh, security belt, some of them have no um, uh, power steering, and so on and so far. Okay, 10% of produced cars, in statistics, you report, we have produced but nobody will buy it and you are not going to sell them because you can't use uh, the car without power steering. Yeah? So in, in some sectors, yes, Russia may rely on China. But what we see, China is not exporting more of technological goods. China is happy to use Russia as a market uh, to supply its goods. Yes, China will definitely supply some of their cars, for example, to to the Russian market and share of Chinese cars is growing. But China is looking, okay, yes, you have uh, uh, the uh, Volkswagen uh, assembly and enterprise in Kaluga. Uh, Yeah, but it will take us a lot of um, uh, money, a lot of new equipment to reestablish. Okay, let us sell you the cars. Yeah, and that's why I think that 2023 we will see some uh, continuation of this process because in some sectors you have components uh, okay, that were enough to support uh, production for, I don't know, several months. But um, uh, talking to the bands issue, I would say the most significant effect, and we cannot predict it right now, it will be the, ban on Europe, uh, the ban, European ban on import of Russian petroleum products. Uh, Russia export via products a a quarter of its oil, and uh, in oil refinery, Russia, when uh, Russia refines oil, it uh, consumes all gas, it sells 60% of diesel, and it sells 80% of fuel. 
but you cannot change the structure of the production. It's the quality of your refineries. So if you are not able to sell diesel and fuel, you will not produce gasoline. And if you do not produce gasoline, you have a problem in the domestic market. You have to cut oil production, and you have problems on the gasoline market, uh, market inside the country. And I would say that will be the major effect that we will see in 2023, and we cannot predict it right now. But still, not once again, no catastrophe, no collapse, mm -hmm. but sliding down the icy road. Can I, can I just press you a little bit on, I mean, I, it seems like what will, the, as certain Russian companies are, are, will struggle, as the, the car sector, for instance, there's been more burden on the Russian state to step in, to make sure companies remain solvent. At the same time, the Russian state also has the burden of, of paying for Russian defense military expenditure that's increasing. At the same time, the Russian state is losing revenue. So is there, is this going to be a burden that the Russian state is sort of unable to sort of fill, given that there could be some decline in, in private sector profitability? Mm, of course, uh, the Russian federal budget is feeling the pressure. And uh, it's, it's not, it's not uh, equal in different sectors. For example, uh, in, if we take uh, revenues of the budget related to production and export of oil and gas, of, uh, uh, they were strong in the first half of the year and they were declining in the second half of the year. But if you take that's what we call uh, revenues, tax revenues related to domestic economic activity like VAT, value-added tax in Russia, profit tax, uh, personal income tax, they were weak in the first, second quarter, but they were strong in the second half because of military expenditures. So, but all in all, the budget deficit will grow and it uh, seems the expenditures uh, will grow as well. The projected budget deficit for the next year is 2% of GDP, but it could be bigger. I don't know, 3% of GDP. Is it a danger? Compared to the US economy, it's not a danger. 3% of GDP is normal budget. Moreover, Russia, as I said, has 6% in fiscal reserves, 6% of GDP. So there will be pressure on the budget. Budget will be less stable. Minister of Finance imposed several changes to the tax legislation, uh, increasing taxes on gas production, on coal export, on uh, fertilizers export, on oil production. But it will not be, once again, I believe that budget will, will be able to finance all expenditures in 2023. In 2024, yes, yes, it may be more difficult, but who cares of 24 right now? Ben, maybe turn to you about sort of the, where the Russian energy sector is, is, is headed. Uh, uh, there's been, um, uh, Russia sort of self-induced sanctioned themselves and not providing gas to, to Europe and turning off the taps. Uh, you know, where is sort of the gas sector going? How do you see Russian energy production? Can it even you know, supply gas to, to, to China at the same amounts? And in the oil sector, I assume they're, they're having, you know, if, they're, if they start to see declines in their ability to sell oil, does that impact their ability to produce? Where do you see the Russian energy sector going in, in 2023? I expect that in the near term, in the next year, say, production will be more resilient than a lot of people think, but clearly we're headed for some degree of decline. And I think the longer term outlook for the oil and gas industry is pretty bleak. So uh, this year, the International Energy Agency predicts that we'll lose 1.6 million barrels a day of production from Russia. I think that's the latest figure. Uh, Alexander Novak estimated that production might decline by 7 to 8 percent. Um, we don't know yet. I think it really depends on these things that we mentioned earlier, the size of the shadow tanker fleet, the ability of India and China to absorb more barrels, etc. Uh, Sergei mentioned some of the issues with the refining sector in Russia, which are important to note. You know, it's possible that if Russia can't place more of its refined products around the world because of the EU embargo, uh, it will just reduce refinery runs or refinery processing, and that will increase the pressure to send more crude abroad. Um, there's always a question about how quickly Russia can uh, restore production if it does decline. There's been a lot of debate about this over the years, whether or not Russia can actually follow through on this threat of shutting in production and punishing anyone who imposes sanctions. That's an open debate. I think we did learn in 2020 when Russia made OPEC plus production cuts that it can swing production a little bit more effectively than many people believed, but clearly that's a concern. 
I think the big issue for the oil industry is over the longer term, it has lost a huge amount of access to equity partners, to uh, financial partners, to trading houses, many commodity houses and super majors and others have basically pulled out of business in Russia and said, we don't want to do business with the Russian oil sector. Over the longer term, that is really going to take a toll. And this is a continuation of trends that have actually been in place for some time. So after 2014, there were some really critical sanctions imposed on the Russian oil industry. And what that really targeted was kind of the next generation of oil projects. So Arctic oil, deep water, shale oil. You know, before that time, a lot of the big majors around the world, the Exxon Mobiles of the world, Equinor, any, they had signed joint venture agreements with the Russian national oil companies, and those sanctions caused them all to pull out. And I think what's happening is that Russia is really losing that ability to develop the next generation of projects. Um, it's not going to have the capacity to do it. It had hydrogen export ambitions. Those are off the table for now. Uh, in, in the LNG sector, Russia's going to have real problems because it doesn't have access to its partners, the super majors, and especially to oil field services companies that are really critical to making these projects happen. And with gas, there are no good alternatives to the European market. It's not like oil. You can't just put it on a tanker and send it around the world. They've lost the European market to a large degree, and they simply won't be able to build pipelines to export that to China and elsewhere anytime soon. It took 10 years plus, I think, to agree with price uh, on a price with China for the Power of Siberia pipeline. These things take a long time. I think China clearly has some reservations about depending too heavily on Russia as an energy partner. And so on the gas side, Russia is really a lot more constrained. So, you know, again, I think from a production standpoint, probably more robust this year than many people believe. The revenue impact is real. It's going to continue. Uh, we're going to see a big decline in revenue from petroleum products and from crude this year. But again, over the medium term and beyond, a lot of challenges. Marie, I want to go to you, and then we'll, we'll turn to the panel for sort of a lightning uh, uh, round of, in, in the few minutes we have left, about what steps we should be taking vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. But, you know, there's been a lot of focus on oligarch sanctions and, um, and sort of eviction of, of Russian wealth and, and uh, Russian oligarch elites from, from the West. How is, I mean, I would assume that inside of Moscow with a Kremlin elite, that there's some cleavages emerging where you had businessmen that were doing quite well in uh, operating in Russia, operating in the West, and now are, are taking real economic hit. Are, are, do you see sort of cleavages emerging because of some of the economic costs and sanctions? The problem here is that when you think of Russian elite, right, you tend to think of them in, from the Western framework, that those are actually um, political groups with certain um, interest and they have certain impact, right? In the Russian case, unfortunately, um, this is not necessarily the case. Th these are interest groups that are mostly after essentially getting a stake out of the redistribution table that the Kremlin is offering to them. So the political power, even if they're hurt, turns out to be quite limited. And we've been uh, observing that pretty much since uh, all the way since 2014. Uh, when, yes, sanctions were in place, and some of them were quite uh, dramatic, pronounced. Think Jerry Pascal, for example, back in 2018. Was a, that was a big blow, not just for him personally, but also for the Russian economy, as well as the world economy, because he, his company was one of the major aluminum producers. Um, yet, yeah, but, you know, did it change anything? Like, did it prevent uh, Putin from starting this war? Uh, not necessarily. So this is not the argument against hidden these groups. It's just a, it's an argument in favor of moderating one's expectations. Uh, what have we seen so far this year is that there's two, on, like, instead of achieving a lead split, which, uh, of, uh, first of all, like, of course there's tensions, no questions. Of course there's groups that are deeply and badly hurt. We see them coming here. We see them complaining, uh, essentially asking the West, you know, to remove those sanctions because they are very badly hurt, but it's very unclear what is it that they can offer in, res in response. Uh, when it comes to the actions, we only have seen two people essentially trying to publicly distance themselves from the Kremlin. One would be the example of Anatoly Chubais, not an oligarch, but a uh, well-off um, politician, but policymaker within uh, the Kremlin who fled <clears throat> and then uh, suddenly got sick with unknown disease. Now he recovered luckily, but he kept silent, probably not to get even sicker in the future. Uh, 
Uh, the other person is Alexei Kudrin. Uh, he is uh, still in Russia, but he stopped being associated to uh, public positions and moved as a head of Yandex, uh, it's Russian Google, essential search company. Uh, so, but those, both of them are so-called system liberals, so they were more pro-Western in the first place, it's known. We don't necessarily see, at least publicly, for publicly available information, the same process taking place in Mangano, FSB or some high-level uh, Silovi key, the security officers. So from that perspective, those sanctions should be definitely in place, but I would not overestimate the effectiveness. There's a high degree of um, loyalty and compliant, compliance between the um, complacency, shall we say, between the Kremlin elites. And that's probably going to stay like this for a while, just because of the way the Kremlin system operates. We've seen also oligarchs sort of, and a lot of R Russians uh, relocate to Turkey, to the, to the Gulf. Uh, and so there's other places that I think they can find a way to, to, to sort of exchange one villa in, in Italy for, for one. On Those the, who relocate, they probably should be ready to, abandon, to leave behind all the assets they own in Russia because the, the signal is clear, right? You leave, you sort of, you lose. Uh, the problem is that the question is why we don't see more people doing that. I mean, you would think at this point they, they have made a lot of money and a lot, a lot, much of that money is outside of Russia. And still we do not see uh, many of these groups, public representatives of those groups, publicly speaking up, uh, publicly dissociating themselves from the Kremlin. There were some trends at the very beginning which were given some hope. Uh, there were some um, boards of directors publicly condemning uh, the war. Uh, but then uh, this process stopped, it didn't take this form of avalanche. And um, as further, going further, you know, more groups within the Kremlin become more essentially involved, incriminated, implicated in these crimes the Kremlin is committing in Ukraine, and so it makes it less likely for them to dissociate from themselves. Policy-wise, though, I would recommend two areas um, going forward. First of all, maybe there should be some carrots, you know, maybe uh, there should be some scenarios as to what should be done explicitly for the sanctions to be removed. So it doesn't happen, you know, behind the curtains, uh, but it has a very clear, um, maybe, scenario. If you want a sanctions to be removed, speak up, you know, leave for, for the oligarchs, for all these groups. Second of all, uh, going after family is another good idea because many of these uh, individuals have families residing in the West still, going to the Western schools, you know, keeping the assets there. And that's something, else, something um, that should be done because this is where it really hurts for them. Excellent. So maybe to just extend off that question in the few minutes we have left, uh, Sergey, over to you on, on what do you think should be done next? The EU is, is, is looking at a tenth sanctions package, but uh, what, what more do you think there is, is there to be done from the, from the U.S. or Western standpoint? What is the goal? What do you want to achieve? First, uh, you have to, uh, you as the West, as the Western politicians, Western uh, decision makers, before answer, asking the question, what should we do? You have to formulate the answer, what do you want to achieve? Yeah? If, uh, you want to, if you want to help Ukraine to win the war, it's not about sanctions, it's about weapons. Yeah, and uh, the slower the process of supplying weapons, the longer is the future of the Ukrainian victory. And sanctions will not help you. Being 10th package, 22nd package, it doesn't matter. Uh, on sanctions, uh, I, on economic sanctions, I uh, would say that uh, there are two ideas. Two ideas. First, uh, after sanctions were imposed in 2014, I very often heard from uh, American decision makers, we don't want to impose sanctions that hurt Russian people. Forget it. Forget it. If you want to make pressure on Russian society, on Russian public opinion, on, on Kremlin, who is very uh, attentively looking on public opinion polls, press Russian people as well as you press oligarch. Don't care about what, whom you are pressing. If you want to uh, strengthen your pressure, do it. And uh, in, the, in economic sanctions, I think that the main emphasis uh, should be done on uh, limiting further technological access of Russian economy to uh, uh, Western technologies, uh, what I call Huawei sanctions. Uh, do not ban only supply, for example, of semiconductors to Russia. Yeah, because, uh, yes, uh, after they imposed those sanctions, semiconductors were not exported or imported from Europe or from the United States. But the, the import of semiconductors recovered, and the main suppliers are Turkey, China, Hong Kong. Okay, if you want to ban, 
made secondary sanctions like don't use US and European equipment, don't use US and European patents. Yeah, so I think that is, that is the idea to make uh, sanctions really work and to make them comprehensive. Yes, I think the, the export control is something we haven't really talked about. It's one of the innovative aspects of the, the sanctions regime. But it, that also puts a huge administrative bureaucratic burden here in Washington on our Commerce Department, our Treasury Department. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things, just simply sanctions enforcement is going to be uh, a, a critical priority. Ben, uh, over to you with the, the, the last word on, on w are, are there other steps that the U.S. and Europe should be thinking about taking vis-a-vis -vis Russia's energy sector? Well, the price cap coalition agreed to come together every two months to review the price cap. Um, you may recall that there were a lot of voices who were more hawkish and wanted a price cap lower than $60 a barrel, Poland and the Baltic states. Uh, they'll review that, and if they feel like they want to dial up the pressure on Russia, they can lower that price cap. And then they can certainly uh, dial up enforcement as well. There will be a lot of fun and games like crude blending and ship-to-ship -ship transfers. Cracking down on that, I think, will be a big priority for sanctions watchdogs in the next year. And is there anything that we, that we could do on the demand side as well to just maybe reduce some of the demand? Is that another area that, that Europe perhaps is, is looking at? I think across the board, because of the economic issues and all the concern about energy security, Europe is doing everything that it can right now to lower demand. Um, from a policy perspective, there have been a lot of moves with the Repower EU plan to do that, especially on the gas side. Um, and then just because of high prices, people have gotten better at conservation. So it takes a while for these things to play out, but you know there are big changes that have happened in the last year, and we should expect that the pressure on Russia will continue and the market will adjust. And overall, I think from a revenue standpoint, these trends are not good for Russia. Well, I want to thank all of you, Sergey, Maria, Ben. Thank you so much for being here. I think it was a, a really uh, fascinating conversation. I mean, the, the overarching question of are sanctions working is always, uh, I think, one that that it will be debated. It's great to have a beer, debate that, or over coffee, whatever your, your form of beverage. But it seems to me that there's a clear economic impact happening uh, on the Russian economy. Uh, and that we'll, we'll see what the impacts are in 2023, but it seems like um, it, they're going to be fairly significant. The question is, how significant does that impact Russian public opinion? Does that impact the calculus or Russia's ability to wage war? I think that remains to be seen. I want to thank you all for, for joining us for this uh, virtual event, which will also be available uh, in podcast form on our Russian Roulette podcast. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for joining us online. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you.